I like leaving the children here during worship because I think it's important that they see their parents worshiping God. I know the modern thing in a lot of congregations is second the kids come in, they're all divided up. I just don't like that. That's just me. And, you know, I know you have to suffer through sometimes because you're maybe if you have children, they're not listening. But, you know, how many of you had grandparents or parents that made you sit there and listen in church? And, I mean, that's part of growing up. Amen? Now, I never went to church because I was Jewish. I went to synagogue, but it was the same thing. Same thing. And the kids, they're not going to die. Amen? They will survive. <laughs> so my wife and Miss Christine and some others have been on the walk to Emmaus this weekend. She'll be back tonight. I'm leaving tomorrow. I'll be gone for a week. So if you guys are looking for me, I'll be gone. Uh, I'm going to be with, no, I'm kidding. I'm going to be in Houston with the Lord. We're going to a district conference for Foursquare. All the pastors from our district get together once a year, see some old friends, great ministry, great worship for the pastors. It's going to be a great time, but I will be back next weekend, Lord willing, with you all. Amen. But we've got people here to hold down the fort if anything comes up and you need anything. Pastor Kayla will be here, Pastor Jeremy, Pastor Brian Massey, Pastor John, who's technically on leave of absence, so try to leave him alone. How many of you know they just had a new baby, him and Claudia? He came in, he preached Friday, but he was looking a little worn, a little tired. They're like, we have to switch baby from sleeping during the day and awake all night to vice versa. So today, guys, the Holy Spirit has really put this, this message on my heart. How many of you know there's a lot going on in the world today? A lot. I was sharing just over the weekend, you know, they shipped five red heifers to Israel, which, by the way, that has to be a genetic modified thing. Just one red heifer is a miracle of God, five from the same place. But either way, they shipped those five over there to Israel. How many of you heard that Russia's conscripting a million men to continue their war against Ukraine because they're losing? And so Russians are fleeing that country by the droves. Iran, which, by the way, I told Sunday school, Iran is seeing right now the greatest revival, by the way, out of all the nations in the world. More people coming to Christ in Iran. And Iran right now is in revolt. As of yesterday, there were dozens of cities where the Iranian people took it over from the government. And the government's bombing some of their own people and some of their own cities. Um, in China, there's a rumor, I'm not sure if it's true, as of yesterday, that the leader of China... Um, has been placed under house arrest, and there's a military coup taking place in China. So I'm not sure if that's accurate, but everything else I told you is 100% accurate. So I'm saying all that to say this. Tonight, Sunday night, is really the start of Rosh Hashanah, the start of Yom Teruah, the Feast of Trumpets. One day, I'm not sure if it's this year or next year or the following year or in five years, but one year, the Lord's going to fulfill the Feast of Trumpets, and you and I are going to hear some heavenly shofar sounds. Actually, you're going to hear a hundred of them, and the hundredth, the Kiel Gadol, the dead and Messiah are going to rise first. Then those who are still alive are going to be with the Lord. Now, people can differ on the timing, but you can't tell me that Scripture doesn't say the Lord's coming back. Amen. So when it's going to be, we can lovingly disagree, but I think it's going to be soon. And I think that we need to live like we're ready. Someone say amen. amen. The Holy Spirit says, remnant, prepare. And I want to talk to you this morning about what a remnant within the body of Christ is. You see, most people, when they hear of church, they think of a church facility. They think of sheetrock. They think of a a cathedral, they think of a, a steeple, but the word church in the scripture in the Greek is ecclesia. It's literally the called out ones. And within those that God has called out to be a part of his kingdom are men and women from many different denominations and non-denominations. Amen? And within that group, there is a remnant 
that are living for God, that are called and chosen and on fire. But within that group is a group that is not ready. They have no oil in their lamp. And the Lord, when he comes, is going to take them unawares. And that is a scary thing, saints. W. Kimball says this. He says, God has always had a faithful remnant of believers who tenaciously clung to the truth, regardless of all cost. They have often been a quiet, unseen company of believers scattered amongst the vast herds of churchianity. And how many of you know that there are many who call themselves believers who are not believers? And God knows who they are. Amen? Jesus said to us, you'll know them by their fruits. If you have a tree producing evil fruit, you know it's an evil tree. Just plain and simple, the Lord said that. Amen? It has bad roots if the fruit on that tree hanging off is bad. I want to start off in 1 Kings chapter 19, verse 14 with you this morning. And this is Elijah. And Elijah had just battled uh, against the prophets of Baal and Ashtoreth on Mount Carmel. God had done miracles, but all of a sudden Jezebel, who was the queen of the northern part of Israel at that time, Jezebel sent a messenger saying, today your head is going to be on a pike. And Elijah in that moment forgot all about God. He got all depressed, all discouraged, and went running all the way to Mount Sinai to a cave that's there. Now, how many of you remember Mount Sinai? Mount Sinai is where God gave Moses the Ten Commandments, okay? And so Elijah is in this cave and... You can read the whole thing in your own time, but basically he's having this conversation with the Lord, and he said, Lord, I've been very zealous for the Lord God of hosts because the children of Israel have forsaken your covenant, torn down your altars, killed your prophets with the sword. I alone am left, and they seek to take my life. Listen, never get to a place where you think that you're the only one. Someone say amen. Amen. Never get to the place that you think that there's none righteous but you. God has a remnant around this world. And it's not a church sign. It's a remnant of people within every facility that calls and names the name of Christ. Amen? I'm not even sure that I would say that everyone who comes to this congregation is a part of the remnant. I would say there are some that aren't because they still haven't yielded their life to Christ. So it's not about the facility you attend. It's about the relationship that you have with God. Amen? So this remnant. So here Elijah's feeling discouraged, feeling depressed. He says, I alone am left. And let's see what the Lord answers. In 1 Kings 19, 18, the Lord speaking to him says, Yet, Elijah, I have reserved 7,000. Everybody say 7,000. 7,000 in Israel, all whose knees have not bowed to Baal and every mouth that has not kissed him. In other words, he's like, "Uh, Elijah, hate to tell you this, but you're not the only one. You're not the only one. Matter of fact, later in the conversation, he gets through. There's thunder. There's lightning. God's not in any of that. Finally, he hears a small, still voice. Now, remember, he's all discouraged in this cave. And the Lord lovingly says in that small, still voice, Elijah, what are you doing here? I love that. Elijah, what are you doing here? Amen? In your life, In my life, there have been moments of discouragement, moments of questioning, Lord, nobody's one to walk with God, nobody's one to love God, and then you hear that small, still voice say, hey, I have reserved a remnant within the body of Christ of those who have not bowed their knee to culture, those who have not bowed their knee to the 
Baal to the God of this world. Amen? And it's men and women of every race, every kindred, every tongue, and every tribe that God has a remnant. Amen? Elijah's moping about in self-pity because he feels like he's the only faithful one left in Israel. Now, I've seen this in congregations. No, I'm the only one who wants to work. Nobody's doing anything for God except for me. Well, hang on a minute. Don't become like Elijah depressed in a cave. God has raised up people who are actively serving, maybe not serving in the same manner you're serving, but they are serving. Someone say amen. amen. When our evangelism team went out yesterday to share the gospel at the Gay Pride Parade, it wasn't just us. There were other congregations, other remnant of people there, and they joined together because there is one faith, there is one kingdom, one Lord. Amen? Amen. We're not divided. Now, we might be a, I'd like to think of us maybe as a thumb. There's thumbs, there's pinkies, there's big toes, there's all parts of the body of Christ. And it takes the whole body of Christ to work together. Amen? But we are not the only one. Someone say amen. amen. And you're not the only one. So this whole idea of a remnant, God gently reproved Elijah by telling him that there were still 7,000 faithful Israelites besides him who had not bowed their knees to Baal. A faithful remnant, listen to me, still exists today. Even though Elijah didn't know they existed, who they were or where they're at. You don't know the little grandmother is 85 years old and can't walk anymore who wakes up at four every morning to pray and intercede for this nation and for the churches of this nation. You don't know her name. You've never met her. You haven't seen her. But God knows, amen? There is a remnant. Now, why is that important? Because it's important because I think in these last days, Holy Spirit is preparing the remnant to do a work like you've never seen before. It's not going to be everybody in every church. It's going to be the remnant of all the churches that God is raising up to live out the reflection of Jesus Christ to this lost and hurting world. Someone say amen. Amen. I don't know about you, but I want to be a part of the remnant, don't you? I don't want to be a spectator. Listen, there is enough spectators. Christianity, a relationship, born-again believers, that is not a spectator sport, amen? Amen. It's a participant, participant sport with the Lord. Through the many cycles of Israel's rebellion and spiritual adultery, a faithful remnant, everybody say faithful remnant, existed within the midst of a corrupt priesthood and religious system. You could go back to the Dark Ages. You could go back to every period in church history before the church, before the Lord was born, you can go back into the uh, uh, history of the nation of Israel, and you will always find a remnant of God's people who are being faithful and serving him in the midst of it all. Amen? So that needs to encourage you. And that needs to make sure in these last days that you know that you're a part of that remnant. I can't know that. You've got to know that. Amen? You've got to be living as a disciple. You've got to be Taking up daily your cross, you've got to be daily denying yourself, daily dying to self, and daily following after Jesus. That's what it takes, amen? Watching everybody else take up their cross doesn't cut it nowadays. The term remnant applied to the faithful remnant who remain loyal to God despite persecution, peer pressure, and testings. Have you ever in your life experienced testings? Medical testing, spiritual testing, relationship testing? Will you remain loyal to God despite those things that come across in your life? The remnant says yes. The remnant says yes. Amen? Because listen, guys, there is a storm approaching. I don't know when it's coming. But I've read the scripture, and I know what the Bible prophesies. And I know 
that God is wanting a bride, a people who are alert and awake and living for him, not living for themselves. Someone say amen. Historical remnants. How about Joshua and Caleb? These guys are amazing. So Joshua started serving the Lord when he was 40 years old under Moses. At the age of 80, Joshua took command of the Hebrew children, the children of Israel, to lead them into the promised land. But remember Joshua and Caleb and 10 others went to spy out the land, and they brought back an evil report? And they went to spy out the land for 40 years and for, I mean, for 40 days. And for every day that they spied out the land, when they brought the evil report, God sentenced them to one year of wandering in the wilderness. Forty years the children of Israel wandered in the wilderness. Every one of that generation passed away. There was a new generation except for two men, Joshua and Caleb. That was a very small remnant, amen? But they got to enter into the promised land. Elijah and the 7,000, we just read, they were a remnant, amen? Elijah was not alone. How many of you remember John the Baptist, John the Immerser, amen? His repentant followers. How many of you remember the four soils of the sower? Jesus told the parable. He says the seed is the word of God and it falls in the cracks and it springs up, but after a while it immediately dies because of the cares of this life. And he goes through all these soils, and how the four soils, only one soil's good. That good soil's the remnant. Amen? The remnant. Then, of course, the last one I want to mention this morning is the parable of the virgins. Remember the, the trumpet sounded, the shofar sounded, and said, Behold, the bridegroom is coming. And the ten virgins woke up. Five had oil and trimmed their lamps, and five had nothing. And the five that had nothing went to buy some oil. But the five who had oil already went in with the groom, and the door was shut. And they were locked out. They couldn't get in. It's a warning, guys. It's a warning. The five with the oil was the remnant. Amen? The Lord Jesus shows a remnant within the church world today. And I want to talk about this and show this to you in two different places. So here in Revelation chapter 3, now if you read Revelation, Revelation basically chapters 1 through chapter 4 verse 1 is the Lord's message to the seven churches. Then after that, you don't hear any more about the churches. Then it's the revealing or the unveiling of Jesus Christ, the spirit of prophecy and the judgment that's to come on this earth to give mankind, humanity, one last opportunity to repent and get things right with God. And here in his message, the Lord's message, in verse 4 he says, You have a few names, even in Sardis, who have not defiled their garments. They shall walk with me in white, for they are worthy. Everybody say a few names. Guess what I would call that? I would call that a remnant. Everybody say a remnant. There's a few in Sardis. It wasn't all. It's never all. It's a few. You have a few names, even in Sardis, who have not defiled their garments. And they shall walk with me in white, for they are worthy. This is the remnant described as those who have not defiled their garments. What's it mean to defile your garment? Your garments where you've been made white by the blood of of Yeshua by the blood of Jesus Christ, amen? Through his redemption, his death, his burial, his atonement, his resurrection. And to defile that garment is to turn back to the things of the world that God delivered you from. Just telling you, you can read it. It's, it's there in Sardis. He warns them. Verse 5, he who overcomes shall be clothed in what kind of garments? White garments. Who's clothed in white garments? He who overcomes. You know what that tells me? It tells me the Lord is looking for us to be overcomers. You're either going to be an overcomer or an undergoer. Amen? How many of you know in your faith in Christ, it's much better to be an overcomer? To be the head and not the tail, above and not beneath. Amen? And with Jesus Christ as the head of his body, He's already overcome. 
So it's not like you have to do a lot. You just have to walk in the victory he's already given us. Amen? Does that make sense? So he who overcomes shall be clothed in white garments, and I will, uh uh-oh, not blot out his name. Not blot out his name. Everybody say not blot out his name. From what book? The book of life. Now, I was talking about this in Sunday school. Listen, why would he say I'm not going to blot out somebody's name unless somebody's name could be blotted out? Just tell you what the scripture says. I'm just the messenger, amen? I was telling them this morning, I said, man, put down the eraser, Lord. (laughs) I want to be found faithful, amen? Don't blot out my name. Hallelujah, amen? No whiteout in the book of life next to Bruce Samuel Tenser. But don't tell me things can't be blotted out because he says here I won't blot out his name. That's kind of a scary thought right there from the book of life. But I will confess his name before my father and before his angels. Hallelujah. What a glorious day that's going to be. Amen. He who has a what? He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Now, this is the last part that I want to talk to you about here this morning. This remnant that the Lord Jesus spoke about is wheat and tares. Everybody say wheat and tares. I want to show you. If you see on the left-hand side is a picture of the wheat, the tares on the right-hand side. Now, I'm going to tell you the difference. This is after the wheat has come to grain. You see the grain heads on it? It's pretty easy to see the difference between the wheat and the tare once it's fully developed. I want to tell you some things about the wheat and tares because the wheat is the remnant. The tear could be a brother or sister or a non-brother or sister who's in the same facility and same church as you. Facts about tares. In the early uh, stages of growth, it's always difficult to discern a tear from a wheat plant. In the early stages, why? Because they look Almost exactly alike. If Eden, though, here you go, a tear can cause sickness and even death. In other words, one person looks like a believer, but they're bringing poison with them. There's a lot of that out there, amen? A lot of them called preachers and pastors. There's a remnant of preachers and pastors that love God, but there's also a group that are tares. They're causing sickness or even death by not preaching the truth of the word of God. Someone say amen. Amen. When both the tear and wheat have headed out, when it comes to the grain, the wheat fruits its grain, it becomes easy to tell the difference. And how Jesus tell whether or not somebody is walking in the truth, you shall know them by their fruit. Everybody say by their fruit. If a wheat produces wheat grain, you know it's what? Pretty simple, amen? A tear can't produce any fruit, no grain, because it's what? Tear, because it's a tear. So just because the tear says, I'm wheat, I'm wheat, I'm wheat, does not make it wheat. What makes it wheat is the fact that it has fruit that bears Evidence and proof that it's wheat. Amen. In our life is our fruit showing forth a reflection of the character and the nature of Jesus Christ. Or are we still at that point in our life where we're living for ourselves instead of living for God? How many of you know that's an attribute of the last days, by the way? 2 Timothy chapter 3, you can look it up later, verses 1 through 3. In the last days, men will be heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God, calling good evil and evil calling good, disobedient to parents, unthankful, ungrateful. Amen? On and on the list goes. 
that would be the fruit of a tear, not the fruit of a wheat. Holy Spirit discernment is the only way to tell the difference in the body of Messiah. And I put here, COVID's a good example. You know what happened with uh, the pandemic? There are still hundreds of churches across America that are still shut down to this day, that never reopened. Because what happened is people used it as an excuse to stop fellowshipping. And once they did, it showed what was really in their heart because they never wanted to go back to fellowship again. And they just stayed out. And the churches closed and the pastors resigned. And it was heartbreaking in one sense, but in another sense it was good because it was a sifting of the wheat and the tares. The wheat and the tares. Can you imagine the first century church saying, hey, you know what? They're throwing believers to the lions in the Roman Colosseum. So let's not come together to pray or fellowship as believers because we might get arrested. Let's wait several years until persecution stops, then start church back up. How many of you know that didn't happen? Someone say amen. Now this COVID thing, just one example. And don't think there aren't more things coming down the pike. It's like every week there's some new pestilence out there. I'm going to not forsake the assembling together of myself with other believers, as the manner of some is, and even more so as I see the day of the Lord approaching. Amen? If I die, I die. <laughs> Hate to tell you this, but since you were born, you've been working your way towards death anyway. Everybody wants to go to heaven. Nobody wants to die. Just telling you, we're all headed there. My elbow is evidence. Amen? Man, you're a pastor. How come you got arthritis? Because I'm old. I'm getting older by the day. I'll be older next week than I am this week. Now I'm a lot younger than some of y'all. <clears throat> I didn't mention any names because I'm smarter than that. Another parable, I'm going to stop there, Brian, before I work myself into a hole. Another parable Jesus put forth to them saying, the kingdom of heaven is like a man who sowed good seed in the field. How many of you know that the word of God is good seed? It is great seed. You don't understand it. You don't care about it. Doesn't change the fact. It's good seed. It's good seed. Amen. But while men slept, his enemy, and you and I have an enemy. Everybody say, I have an enemy. Satan, who roams the earth as a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. You and I have an enemy of our soul. The enemy came and sowed tares among the wheat. The enemy plants the tares and went his way. But when the grain had sprouted and produced a crop, then the tares also appeared. Remember I told you it's easier to tell wheat from a tare once it comes to a grain, right? So the servants of the owner came and said to him, Sir, did you not sow good seed in your field? How then does it have tares? So picture this, a real field, you plant it wheat, but then some bad neighbor came along while you were sleeping, plant tares, and you're watering it, and it starts to grow, and all of a sudden, you recognize, hey, the weed I recognize, how'd the tares get there? Bad neighbor planted them, right? He said to them, an enemy has done this. The servant said to him, do you want us then to go and gather up the tares? Do you want us to pull up the tares? How many of you have ever, ever pulled weeds? A lot of weeds. How many of you don't enjoy pulling weeds? If you do enjoy pulling weeds, we're going to pray for you. <laughs> pulling weeds. I mean, you try to get them up by the roots so they don't come back. Amen? Do you want us then to go and pull up all these tares? For he said, no, lest while you gather up the tares, you also uproot the wheat with them. 
Let both grow together until the harvest. And at the time of the harvest, I will say to the reapers, first gather together the tares and bind them in bundles to burn them, but gather the wheat into my barn. That, y'all, is a scary thing right there. Because the tares are good for nothing. You can't eat them. They're sickening. They're poisonous. They'll kill you. So all they would do is gather them up and burn them. But the wheat, that's the good thing, because you need the seed to replant next year. Amen? So I want to leave you with this thought this morning. In congregations all across America where we live, from sea to shining sea, many chairs like this, there's wheat and tares growing right next to each other. Now, the Lord's not separating them out just yet because he don't want to uproot the wheat. Because not all the wheat can understand, hey, that I thought they were wheat, and they're not. They're a tear. And so they get uprooted, and you get uprooted too. God doesn't want that. So he's waiting, but there is a day. Everybody say, there is a day. There is a day coming where the remnant will be separated. And that day is coming quicker than you think, guys. I warn you prophetically. How many of you remember before COVID hit, I warned you guys months and months ahead of time, amen? We bought boxes for the widows. That was back when masks were still available. We bought masks. We, we had boxes stacked up. Josh thought I was kind of crazy at first. He's like, Pastor, are you sure about this? I said, yes, the Lord has shown me. And then COVID hit. I'm telling you the same thing, not to scare you, but I'm telling you there is a storm on the horizon. I don't have the details, but I'm telling you, God's people have got to be prepared spiritually to weather the storm. Because in the midst of any storm, stand to your feet, in the midst of any storm in our life, guys, Holy Spirit wants his remnant to be a picture of, of the perfect eye of the storm where there's calm and where there's peace. You know, this big hurricane that's fixing and develop and head towards Florida, <clears throat> some are saying it's going to be a monster. I've been in too many hurricanes on the Gulf Coast with Pastor John. I don't like playing hurricane, but I can tell you, when a hurricane passes over and you're in the eye of the storm, it's blue sky and it's, the most incredible thing, because you know all around you, savage winds are blowing, but there's peace. And it's such a beautiful picture of our lives as believers that even in the midst of these storms today and those that are soon approaching, you and I can walk in peace. I sleep good at night, except for body aches and other things. Amen? But I don't fret. I don't worry. I'm not worried about nuclear weapons. I'm not worried about... Listen, none of that bothers me. The only thing I'm concerned with is I want to be found pleasing to him who called me and chose me and saved me. Every head bowed, every eye.